Welcome back to the Hard Run Box News Corner. Been a good week for releases this week, as I mentioned in last week's episode. We've got the launch of the disappointing Radeon RX 5500 XT, along with the new and actually quite decent Radeon Software Adrenaline 2020 edition. Pretty, and that pretty much rounds us out for 2019. So if you missed our coverage on those two things, go back and give it a watch because, yeah, I don't think we'll be getting any more releases uh, throughout the rest of the year. But for now, let's talk about the latest news. But before that, a quick word from today's sponsor. Viotech is the kind of company you want on your side. A tech company for gamers, by gamers, dedicated to making only the best monitors at real world prices. And here at Hardware Unboxed, we've tested and continue to recommend many of these displays. Viotech have made a name for themselves, building feature rich products that you don't have to be rich to get. All Viotech gaming monitors are protected by a zero tolerance dead pixel policy with customer support fully staffed in the US. And now they offer an all new three year warranty. Solid performance, beautiful build monitors that won't break the bank. Learn more at viotech.com. First topic this week is a surprising one from Intel. They've outlined a 10 year roadmap for their foundry technology, taking us from 10 nanometer today through five new nodes up to plants in 2029. Now, historically, Intel have been quite cagey about their future technologies and roadmaps. But given these days they are behind TSMC in terms of leading edge designs, I guess opening up a little bit isn't so bad. As usual, the experts over at Anantec have a great article breaking down the intricate technical details here that's well worth a read if you're interested in process technology, but we'll go over the basics. Firstly, there are two different versions of the slide in question. One is from Intel themselves and another from their partner ASML, which has been modified. Intel's slide doesn't mention any specific node names beyond 10 nanometer, while ASML has labeled them 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer, 2 nanometer, and 1.4 nanometer. And it's pretty likely these names are correct, given that's the generally expected cadence we're going to see. But I guess we should note here that at least for now, Intel aren't officially naming them. In any case, there seems to be a pretty good and consistent cadence for Intel's plans. Each node will have two optimizations, possibly more, but this chart only lists two. A plus for the first refinement and plus plus for the second refinement refinement, with each refinement taking about a year. The one exception to this is 10 nanometer, which is already on 10 nanometer plus for current Ice Lake processors. The roadmap suggests that will progress to 10 nanometer plus plus in 2020 and 10 nanometer plus 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 in 2021. This will overlap with new nodes, with Intel using multiple teams to ensure leading edge nodes and node optimizations run smoothly and concurrently. So every two years, when a new node is ready, Intel will also be on their second second refinement of the old node providing the best performance. And these two nodes should be on the market simultaneously. We already basically have that today with 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer parts on the market at the same time, each with different goals. The other interesting thing is Intel mentions backport opportunities for architectures designed for new nodes. They say, for example, that first generation seven nanometer architectures could be backported to work on 10 nanometer plus plus plus, and first gen five nanometer could be backported to seven nanometer plus plus. This also aligns with some rumors that are suggesting Intel will be doing just that with 10 nanometer architectures eventually making their way back to 14 nanometer. We can also see where Intel's development currently lies for these nodes. They have 10 nanometer plus plus and 7 nanometer in the development stage, while anything beyond that are in various early stages. 5 nanometer in 2023 is in the definition stage, while 2 nanometer and 1.4 nanometer merely appear to be being researched, which makes sense given their distant launch targets. And these launch targets could shift around. They probably will, given what we've seen from Intel in the past couple of nodes, and at least with their current stuff. So yeah, take those firm launch dates that are in this thing as a bit of a grain of salt. But I think this slide is pretty informative overall about what Intel plans to do with their CPU architectures and process nodes to deliver the optimal experience across product lines. And again, we've already seen that with 10 nanometer ice lake launching alongside 14 nanometer parts. In the future, I think we can expect low power parts to first launch on new nodes that might not scale up as well to higher frequencies while high performance chips remain on optimized older processors. I expect that eventually when Intel moves the high end to 10 nanometer, 
we'll see low power mobile chips move to seven nanometer at the same time or closely after that, fitting with what Intel is showing here. And they might also take the opportunity to backport their architectural changes to the old optimized node, giving them the best available combination of, I guess, architecture and frequency that's allowed at the time. You know, give the latest architecture, but optimize that for the processes that make sense to get the best frequencies and performance for each of their different ranges. Whether or not this will actually be successful up against TSMC and other leading edge foundries remains to be seen, but certainly Intel has fallen back to the pack here and no longer have a multiple year lead when it comes to fab technology. Intel are even stating these days that they are expecting to match TSMC with upcoming nodes rather than outright beating them like has been the talk from Intel for decades. They expect their seven nanometer to match TSMC's five nanometer and five nanometer to match TSMC's three nanometer. Although TSMC will likely be first to market Market in both instances. TSMC are expecting 5 nanometer to hit the market in 2020 compared to 2021 for Intel's next generation node. So a significant shift in leadership here among foundries and one that is already having big implications in the market as we've seen with what AMD has been able to do on 7 nanometer. Hot off the presses is the news of Microsoft's next generation Xbox, which is being called the Xbox One X. Wait, wait, sorry, the Xbox Series X. Yep, the Xbox Series X, one of the most terrible names Microsoft could have come up with, but I guess that's par for the course with Microsoft these days. Hope the name doesn't confuse too many customers into thinking the Series X isn't actually that different to the One X, because the upgrade here seems to be quite significant, and I wish it had gotten, yeah, a name that kind of reflected that. Anyway, Microsoft aren't giving all the details on this console just yet, as you'd expect, and most of the information here isn't all that new given what's been talked about over the last year or so, but I still think console tech is quite interesting as it informs the direction PC gaming will go. So what Microsoft have revealed about the Xbox Series X is the design. It's this tall rectangular prism that's reminiscent of some small form factor PCs like Corsair's One. It will be capable of 4K gaming at 60fps with the possibility of up to 120 fps FPS, which is a welcome improvement given how fantastic high frame rate gaming is. It'll also support variable refresh rate and have 8K capabilities, so almost certainly we're looking at HDMI 2.1 output here to support all that. Hopefully this will mean many more console games come with unlocked frame rates to make use of variable refresh, or at least higher frame rate modes that allow gaming at above 30 FPS for once. The processor inside will be Zen 2 based, not surprising anyone here, and the GPU will use AMD's next generation RDNA architecture, so presumably RDNA 2, and it will support hardware accelerated ray tracing. Microsoft talks about a few other technologies too, including variable rate shading, auto low latency modes, and dynamic input latency, which will make the Series X the most responsive console ever. Plus, there will be an SSD to cut down on load time significantly. Judging by some of the gameplay footage they showed, clearly this thing is very powerful and will be using some form of a big AMD GPU, which everyone has been dreaming about for a while now. It also seems very likely at this point that the console will have eight Zen 2 cores, giving it a massive performance increase over the slow Jaguar CPU that was used in existing consoles. While we don't have full specs yet, this next generation of consoles should mean big news for PC gaming. Having a faster CPU in these consoles means more games will utilize those CPU cores, and having a high core count CPU for gaming will be more relevant than ever. And the games themselves will be able to do much more with a faster CPU. On top of that, we'll likely see games require an SSD to stream assets at suitable speeds, Plus, the graphics requirements could be very high depending on where the GPU lands. The Xbox Series X won't be released until 2020, so there's still plenty of time to save up your money to either buy that console, or as true PC gamers love to do, just upgrade their PCs to beat it. Silicon Lottery have started binning the AMD Ryzen 9 3950X, and boy, will it cost you a fortune to buy a processor that's only capable of a mild overclock. But it does give us some interesting insights into how well binned the 3950X is, and what sort of variants we can expect from retail chips. Now, we already know the 3950X appears to be better binned than the 3900X, using more efficient chiplets that can run at their desired clock speeds using lower voltages. Silicon Lottery's data seems to show this is true, because while 100% of their test chips can hit a 4.0 GHz all-core overclock, just 56% hit 4.1 GHz all-core, and just 19% did 4.15 GHz, so just under 20% of 3950Xs are capable of a mild 150 MHz overclock, suggesting there is almost no room here for overclocking. Voltage requirements range from 1.287 volts for a 4 GHz overclock to 1.325 volts vCore for the 4.15 GHz chips.
Silicon Lottery's bins are already completely out of stock, but they were charging $850 for the 4 gigahertz model, which is a $100 price hike, even though apparently all chips they tested could hit this overclock, so not sure why you'd want to buy this bin over simple retail chips. I guess maybe they offered it at this price, considering 3950Xs are widely out of stock at retail in general. The 4.05 gigahertz model costs $900, then it rapidly increases to $1,050 for 4.1 gigahertz and a huge $1,500 for 4.15 gigahertz. At that point, you're going to be much better off with a Ryzen Threadripper 3960X, but hey, I guess if there's a market for these overclockable 16 core CPUs, then yeah, go for it. Another fantastic piece from Anantec has dived deep into early yield numbers for TSMC's upcoming 5 nanometer node, which is scheduled for high volume manufacturing in the first half of 2020. The yield numbers TSMC presented at the IEEE IEDM conference are from early risk production, but it does give us a few insights into how successful their 5 nanometer node has been so far. TSMC said that they achieved average yields of about 80% with their test dyes, with a peak yield greater than 90%. However, Anantec believes their test die was unrealistically small compared to modern chips that will actually be built on 5 nanometer. When extrapolating TSMC's numbers to 100 square millimeter dies typical of modern mobile SOCs, they achieved yields of about 32%. For a Zen 2 chiplet size, that would be 41% yield. Now that's not particularly amazing, but given its risk production, it's not also entirely unexpected. 5 nanometer is set to bring significant gains over 7 nanometer though, including a 1.8 times increase to density, a 15% power gain, or a 30% power reduction depending on the design goals. It remains to be seen how well this can be scaled up to high frequencies. For the AMD fans out there eyeing off these nodes for future AMD products, currently we are still yet to receive Zen 3 on 7 nanometer plus, so chips built on 5 nanometer are still a little way away. According to WCCF Tech, so take this with a grain of salt, Intel are planning to release 10th gen Comet Lake S processors in April of 2020 along with Z490 motherboards to support them. Apparently this news originally comes from HKE PC who have an average record when it comes to these sorts of rumors. Normally I don't bother discussing rumors that don't sound right, but this timeline does actually fit with what we've been hearing from industry sources, which is that Intel will be looking to release high performance 10th gen parts sometime around March to April of next year. Of course, we already have 10th gen CPUs for low power applications such as Comet Lake U and Ice Lake, plus 10th gen HDT parts, so the launch of Comet Lake S and presumably Comet Lake H as well for high performance mobile will round out the bunch. As has been widely rumored for ages now, it's expected that Comet Lake S will bring up to 10 cores to Intel's mainstream desktop platform while still being built on 14 nanometer. This latest rumor also suggests we'll have more PCIe lanes, 40 total up from 24, although these will be still split, of course, between the CPU lanes and PCH lanes and will only be PCIe 3.0. And we will also get Wi-Fi 6 support and a few other things. No idea how true any of that stuff is, but I guess that's just the rumor for now. As for actual processors, an entry appeared in 3D Mark this week showing the Core i5-10600, if you want to believe that, um, which is supposedly bringing 6 cores and 12 threads at a slightly higher clock speed than existing Coffee Lake parts. And this seems to be what we'll be getting from the 10th gen. Core i9 parts will move up to 10 cores, Core i7 through Core i3 will regain hyper-threading, and then we'll also see slight clock speed gains, probably Intel's standard 100 megahertz affair if I had to guess. And final topic for this week is a bit of a follow-up to RX 5600 rumors from last week. We've now seen some RX 5600 submissions to the Eurasian Economic Commission, or EEC, which reveals RX 5600 XT and RX 5600 models from ASRock and ASUS. It seems that ASRock have listed the cards as 6GB, while ASUS has given 8GB, although video cards suggest this might be an error on ASUS's part, given they've heard Gigabyte also have 6GB cards in the works. So this, I guess, adds a little bit of credence to the rumors that we reported on last week. And that's it for this one. As always, you can do the usual YouTube stuff. You can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox. Usually every Friday, we probably will have the last episode of News Corner for the year coming up next week. So yeah, subscribe if you don't want to miss that one. Uh, what else? Yeah, you can support us on Patreon. That's a great way to support the channel directly and have a nice chat with us in our Discord chat. We also have our merch, probably the last reasonable time to get some of these hardware unboxed, happy unboxing t-shirts and sweaters or jumpers for the Australians in there. So um, yeah, check those out. Links in the description below. I'll catch you in the next one.